I want to thank everybody for coming this evening. Um, this is, I've been looking forward to this. Phil and I have tried to get together for many years. Um, so I'm grateful that we can do this via Zoom and we are recording this so we can watch it again. It will be up on our YouTube channel on the Groton Municipal Television. So without further ado, we are here tonight to understand your best friend with dog listener, Phil Klein. He started this about 30 years ago, Phil? When no, it was 12, 12 years ago. No, oh, 12 years ago, when he rescued a special dog named Abby from Labs for Rescue. At the time, he had no idea about the journey he would be privileged to take with Abby. Abby's behavioral challenges were the motivation for Phil to learn a lot more about dogs and find a way to help Abby overcome her fears. In the process, Phil discovered Jan Fennell, the dog listener who had developed a revolutionary methodology for training dogs based on their instincts. In April 2009, Phil attended Jan Fennell's foundation and advanced canine communications course and proudly becoming a certified dog listener. Through in-home consultations, volunteer work with Labs for Rescue and other rescue organizations and public talks, Phil has been honored to help thousands of dog owners and their dogs. And tonight he's gonna teach us the four key drivers of canine behavior, how to interact your dog to, create, to transform its behavior in a kind, lasting way. So without further ado, turn it over to Phil. Okay. I'm, I'm actually going through the same material that I would go through if, if, if we were working together, you and your home and me here and, and, and on Zoom. I used to go into people's homes, but because of balance issues, I can't drive very far anymore or go into people's homes, but that's okay. I'm not complaining about it. But I can, I, uh, the, the information we're going over tonight is patterned after my in-home consultation. Um, and it actually doing consultations by Zoom has, has uh, worked out very well. I'm not gonna say much more about that because you came to get information about your dogs, uh, not, my, not, not have a big talk about my um, services. But this is a hefty slice of the material that we, will go, we would go through in your home. I just can't go through it in as much detail or you know, answer a whole bunch of specific questions uh, from each person. Okay, so, but with that said, let's start with the key. What, what the heck drives a dog's behavior? So we're, this, this is gonna give us a frame of reference for the stuff that we cover a little bit later. That's why I'm covering this now. Uh, the, the four key factors that drive be, their behavior are their canine instincts inherited from the wolf, their personality, each dog has a different personality. Its environment, in other words, where it lives and also where you take it, even on walks. And then the fourth area is your conversations that you have with your dog. And I don't mean talking conversations necessarily because it's all interactions with your dog or dogs, okay? So canine inst instincts inherited from the wolf. Uh, although a lot of dogs don't look like wolves, uh, they're basically almost identical in terms of DNA. There's only about a three tenths of a percent difference between wolf DNA and dog DNA. In fact, you can take the right size dog and mate it with a wolf and start a new um, bloodline. So what, were, what are these instincts? A dog wants to be part of a pack, needs to know where it fits in the pack, and has to have a leader. And it also thinks like a wolf that, that if it doesn't have a qualified leader, the pack will not survive. And that's the motivation for the dog to take the leadership job in our world, a world it doesn't understand. Dogs adapt to our world, but they don't understand our world. They don't even understand their food bowl. The way they relate to it is that it is part of the kill. It's the bones of the kill. That's important for later on, okay? Um, okay, so let's, let's say we have a dog that takes on the, the, um, uh, the job of leader. Now we come to personality. Does the dog have, the, have a leadership personality? Is it assertive? Is it calm? Is it confident? Uh, is it... Uh, extroverted, 
or does it have a personality that's the opposite of that? You know, that's my maybe as anxious, fearful, high strung, introverted. You know, all these are not good qualities for a pack leader. A dog that has, you know, the 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 qualities that don't fit with leadership, a comparable wolf in the wild would never become a leader. The pack would not let it be a lead, be a leader because it's not qualified. But our dogs, if they don't see that we're qualified, they will take the job of leader. So we've got a dog that's um, functioning according to its wolf pack um, uh, instincts, has the wrong personality. And what the job involves is being responsible for the survival of the pack in a world it does not understand. That is a high stress, high pressure job and if the dog doesn't have a suitable personality, or at least put it this way, the, the, the less suitable a dog's personality is, uh, the more you're apt to have behavioral challenges, okay? Um, the, the third factor is environment, where you live, where your dog lives, the sights, the sounds, the smells, inside your home, outside your home, what goes on in your home, is it a high traffic home, is it a hectic home? Or is it a calm home? All these fit, all these factors are uh, important. And then the last area that has a key impact on their, uh, uh, their behavior is how we interact with them. And that's where it's at. Because you can't change their canine instincts. You can't change their personality. You, you, you could remodel your house. That still wouldn't help the dog, probably. So their behavior is all about our interactions or conversations that we have with them okay um and and okay so let's move on to so those are the four key factors some of you may have realized breed is not in there breed is not in there because they all speak the same language doesn't matter what breed your dog is it speaks the same all canines speak the same language that they inherited from the wolf in fact, the wolf speaks the you know the signals you're going to learn tonight, the leadership signals. Um, the wolf speaks those signals also, or, you, or or speaks that language. So it doesn't matter what breed your dog is. It may matter to you, particularly if you wanted a small dog and didn't get a small dog, or vice versa. Or maybe you wanted a dog to do a particular job, like you know, like if you wanted a hunting dog, then breed would matter. But otherwise, it doesn't. So you're going to learn tonight to think like your dog and speak canine language okay now i in the next things in the uh, in the uh, agenda says behavior is all about conversations well we've covered that fact okay so how do we how do we kind of get how do we have problems with our dogs we apply human thinking to them yes they're pack animals we're pack animals but they think a lot differently than we than, than uh, we do. So um, you know, one of the common uh, misperceptions about actually, we had an example of it already when we were talking about some dogs get on the counter at home. So if you make eye contact or talk to your dog when it's misbehaving, you're rewarding unwanted behavior. Most people don't know that. I didn't know that. I was clueless about dog behavior until I started doing this. So we're gonna cover that a little bit more later on, but, but there are no verbal corrections in dog lessons. We don't make eye contact with the dog and we don't talk to it. And if we have time, we will get to the corrections. The corrections are later on in the handouts, which they're very simple, but yet they're very powerful. And by the way, they're also dog friendly. We don't do anything that's not based on the nature of the dog. Dog listening is 100% dog friendly. So again, we apply human thinking to our dogs. A second example would be, you know, if you have other people living with you, when you return from the grocery store, you would never think about ignoring that person if they were there. You'd say hi, right? You'd ask, you'd act friendly. Well, if you do that with your dog when you walk in, you're telling your dog it's in charge. So when you come home from a, after when you rejoin your dog, 
You don't want to talk to it. You don't want to make eye contact with it and you don't want to pet it. And then after a short delay, which I'm going to explain a little bit more later on, you can give your dog all the love you want. But that, that, that initial lack of interaction is very important because you remember I said the dog needs to know where it fits in the pack and has to have a leader. Well, this is how they figure out where they fit in the pack. Their, their favorite method is to seek attention. So we'll, we, will come, we will come back to that. Um, so that actually, you know, so, you know, we, again, we wouldn't, we think it's, we think it's rude to ignore the dog, but it's not rude. It's what they need for their emotional well-being. So you will be the leader and the dog will feel safe and secure in our world. And by the way, dogs that don't feel safe and secure, at least some of them, not all of them, that's where nervous aggression comes from because they're feeling so unsafe but yet they are responsible for the survival of the pack in a world they don't understand, okay? So uh, I've already given you an example that we inadvertently reward unwanted behavior. We inadequately reinforce desirable behavior. And I see this a lot of times, that people are too blasé when they call the dog to them and, and, and they barely reward the dog. You got to reward your dog when it comes to you. If you want, if you want to reinforce the information, if you want to reinforce the behavior that you're looking for, you got to reward it with praise, love, and sometimes a food reward. I call that having a party. Have a party with your dog when it performs as as requested. Okay. So again, this is high level at first. All right. We're going to get into more detail soon. Um, and then last, uh, we give our dogs that high pressure job of being a leader. So if you can regain pack leadership, then what are your dog's jobs? Well, it's eat, sleep, and play. That's your dog's jobs if you're the leader. And oh, by the way, they'll still be the sentinel. They'll still alert you when they think there's something outside you need to be paying attention to, like a possible danger, okay? So, all right, so let's move on. The solution, then how do you fix this? It's basically make dog-friendly changes in your interactions with your dog in five key areas, and we're gonna cover those. Status, which is things like, um, can you go to your dog? Or what does it mean when you go to your dog? When can you give it attention, okay? Uh, when is it okay for you to join you on furniture? Um, how should you, what, what should you do immediately prior to leaving your dog? And what should you do when you rejoin it? Those areas. Is it okay for the dog to invade your space? So we're going to, we're going to, that's the kind of things we're going to cover under status. Feeding. Leaders control food. Leaders are the providers. So as an example, so you want to be the one that determines when to feed your dog, not your dog. And you know that some of you, it's like your dog can tell time. 5.30 comes or maybe 5.45 and your dog is bugging you. Where's the food? What's wrong with you? You haven't fed me yet. Well, guess what? If you give in to that, you're telling your dog it's in charge of food. That's another thing that makes it think it's the, it's the leader. Uh, perceived danger is about handling danger or handling your dog when it alerts you to a possible danger. It's a three-step process we'll be going through. The hunt, you're probably wondering, what the heck is this guy talking about? The hunt? I don't take my dog hunting. Well, instinctively, as soon as they hit the air, they think they're hunting. We think we're walking, but they think they're hunting. And by the way, if your dog pulls on a leash, that's a key indicator that it is in charge because decisions are made from the front of the pack. So your dog wants to be out in front to check for dangers and conduct the hunt. And then the last area is, is play. And I have to say that <clears throat> if you pick up a Jan Fennel book or a Tony Knight book, Tony's also a dog, dog listener, he's uh, Jan's son, you would see only four areas. I've separated out play just to make life a little simpler, a little things a little clearer. But I, I use all the same information that Jan and to Tony taught me over 12 years ago. And, and of course, I've picked up additional information as I've gone along, okay? 
So again, dog listening is learn to think like your dog and speak its language based entirely on the nature of the dog. It's 100% training. The training is done on your and your dog's turf. And believe it or not, when you are the leader, your dog will largely behave well voluntarily. You won't have to spend much time managing it. And why is that? Because in the wild, subordinate pack members cooperate with leaders instinctively, okay? Back to dogs don't bite out of the blue. This article is on my website, which is www.fillthedoglistener.com. It's also on my ha uh, handouts. So once you get the handouts, you'll know how to get a hold of me or go to my website. Uh, I put this article in for two reasons. One is that probably 90 or 95 percent of dog bites could be avoided if people, and this applies to a strange dog, you know, a dog that doesn't know you or doesn't know your dog. It also can apply to your dog, although it might be less of a factor because your dog would be more comfortable with you. Invading the dog space. Some dogs have personal space issues. So don't invade the dog space, call it to you. You know, if the owner says it's friendly, the safest thing you can do is to call the dog to you. If it comes to you, that means it wants attention. If it doesn't come, take a rain check. Don't force it, okay? And if the dog does come to you, don't go over its head with your hand because sometimes that can be taken that, that can startle the dog. So those are, those are a couple of safety tips. Now, the other thing in this article, and I'm going to skip a lot of this in the interest of time. And by the way, you know, if you have questions about stuff we're talking about tonight, I love talking with people. Don't hesitate to call me. You, you're not going to be charged anything. There's no obligation, okay? There's a bunch of pictures in this article, eight to be exact. Only one dog, the German Shepherd, is, is in a frame of mind where it wants, where it's comfortable meeting. It's going to be comfortable meeting somebody it doesn't know. The rest of the dogs are going to be in, at some level of, of uh, stress or discomfort or worry. And, you know, some of the common things like the dog's tail is straight up or is held high is an example of a dog that's on alert. That may not be comfortable. Uh, a dog that's licking its lips may not be comfortable to meet somebody. You can go meet a dog that's licking its lips. Some dogs look worried. One of the things that a dog commonly does when it's under pressure that people don't know, I didn't know, is they yawn. They don't yawn typically if they're tired. They yawn because they're uncomfortable or, feely, or they're feeling pressure. Okay. Um, and by the way, if, you, if your dog starts yawning while you're doing something with it, that dog is probably trying to tell you, I don't like what you're doing. So the best thing you can do is stop doing it. My Abby did not like to be hugged. So I never got to give her basically a full hug. The closest I could get was, was head on her back and hand on her, uh, on her chest. And I had to, though, give her a good back rub before she was relaxed enough to let me do that. So that, that's an example. And I loved her like crazy. She's the dog that made me a dog this time. You know, tail tuck is another one. The dog is scared. So you can take a look at the um, pictures. And the headline here that, that is of importance in terms of what we're talking about is a high percentage of bites can be prevented by avoiding eye contact and by not invading a dog's space. So making eye contact and going into a dog's space can be a double whammy, all right? So you don't wanna lock, eye, lock eyeballs with a dog because they, they might take that as a threat and you don't wanna go into their, their, their personal space, okay? So I think you'll find this, the, ad, the, uh, the, uh, the um, article pretty self-explanatory. And if you don't, don't feel like you're, you know, it's, it's, it's silly for you to ask a question. You call me and ask a question, okay? Because, you know, I, I, I'm coming with 12 uh, years of experience uh, doing this. Um, okay, dog-friendly principles. For those of you that have that handout, I'm going to run through this real quick also. 
Number one is, it says, it's what you do that counts, not what your dog does. So what does this mean? It means that if you're getting behavior that you don't want, it's on you. It's how you're interacting with your dog, which we've already covered. It's not the dog's fault. Don't blame the dog for its behavior because you're the one who has to make the dog friendly changes in your interactions to straighten out that behavior. And I think, you know, at one time or another, certainly going back before I knew this, I used to think it was always the dog. I mean, how could I be a bad dog, a dog trainer? Turns out I wasn't a very good dog trainer, but that's beside the point, uh, before I learned all this information. Um, <clears throat> in dog listening, we are non-confrontational. We don't intimidate the dog. We don't stare it down. We don't use force. We, we um, don't use harmful gadgets. I hope none of you use shock collars or prong collars. They're, they're just horrible devices. There's no need for them. So please don't use those things. In fact, shock collars have been um, outlawed in parts of the UK. And, and my understanding is that PetSmart doesn't sell them anymore. Because why, why train a dog with fear? The dog is already scared because it's in our world and perhaps is the leader. So why take a scared dog and train it with fear? It doesn't make any sense. Um, okay, non-confrontational also means calm. It never pays to get upset with a dog. You're just eroding the trust, the special level of trust that you're trying to build to become the dog's leader. Now, it's hard sometimes to not get upset with a dog. But find a way to calm yourself down before you get amped up too much. And what I suggest is singing. You know, just sing whatever song pops in your head. It doesn't matter whether or not you're, you're a good singer. Your dog doesn't care. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll sing anything. A lot of times I sing um, Good Day Sunshine by the Beatles. You cannot stay in a bad mood with Good Day Sunshine. Or Here Comes the Sun. Okay. Um, Consistent, so co consistency is important. You're, you're going to make mistakes. You're not going to get it right 100% of the time. But basically, you've got to use the, the, the leadership signals every day, and you got to use them consistently. Um, consistency is convincing because that's how you build trust, is by, by consistently using the leadership signals that we're going to go over. Um, the other part of convincing is, is, is your dog has got to be able to connect the dots, which means if you wait too long to correct it or reward it, it has no idea why you're doing what you're doing. You know, one of the common things that at least some folks do is their dog goes to the bathroom outside and when it comes in, they reward it for going to the bathroom outside. That, that opportunity to reward going to the bathroom outside is long gone by the time the dog comes in. So the dog either thinks it's getting a cookie, it's a freebie, or for some other reason. Um, patience and persistence. I don't think I have to explain patience and persistence. It just takes a lot of patience and persistence to train a dog. Plan ahead or think ahead. You're going to learn some stuff tonight. Um, you're probably going to want to reverse it. I can reverse it. Rehearse it in your mind before you use it. So think about it. Yeah, you guys, we all think about lots of things before we're, we're going to do them. Like maybe when we get up in the morning, well, what am I going to wear today? So you're just going to apply that to uh, thinking about what you're going to have to do to send your dogs the right leadership signals at the right times, okay? Uh, learn from mistakes and move on, which is a good life lesson because you're going to make mistakes. So learn from mistakes that you make and then move on. No sense in beating yourself up. Make training for fun for you and your dog. In other words, don't overtrain. You, you know, if you, if you and your dog can train for a half an hour, fine. But you don't have to do that to have success. You can train for five minutes. You can train when commercials are on TV. You can practice recall. Or you can practice this little walking exercise I'm going to tell you about later. So take advantage of minutes. Uh, and the minutes add up. And they're important. Okay. We already talked about having a party when your dog performs as requested. Always praise, uh, love when possible, and, and 
you, know, you can give a food reward lots of times to get behavior, but once you get in the behavior you want, go random. So you don't turn it into a bribe, okay? And then last but not least, have fun. So before we hit the signals, any questions? I do okay. have a question from okay, Karen okay, about how to prevent a dog from pulling on a walk. Are you going to cover that later or you want to address I am, that I now? am going to, yes, I am going to cover that. Okay. Let me give you, let me give you a simple answer though. Uh, one of the things that you can do is just stop because the dog wants movement. Okay, there's other things you're going to have to do, but just stop and don't move until the dog releases the tension in the leash. That teaches them if you pull, we're not going anywhere. And if you if there's if there's slack in the leash, that's when we move. It takes and by the way, it takes time. Just one repetition, the dog is not going to get the message. Sometimes it takes a whole bunch of repetitions, and you got to do this when you have time. You know, you don't want to do this when you're in a rush and you got to get to work or get to an appointment or something. Because because you're going to be tensed up and the dog is going to know you're tensed up, and that's not a good formula for. Uh, a training session. By the way, they're very sensitive to our moods. So we're gonna get into the leadership signals. And for those of you who have the leadership signals memory jogger, you can follow along. I'm gonna read them, okay? Or read what they are. So those of you who don't have the handouts know what we're talking about. So I'm now in the area of status. Of course, the whole thing is about status, but these, uh, all these six things that are under status uh, fit together. That's why they're here. And they are movement, eye contact and talking, affection and attention, separation, maintaining your personal space and who is on the throne. If you go to your dog for any positive reason, you are subordinating yourself to your dog. You're paying homage to it. So, you, if so unless you wanna correct the dog or prevent it from being harmed, you're not gonna go to your dog anymore. You're gonna call it to you if you wanna interact with it. And by the way, you know, you can give it, you can motivate it to come to you. You know, you can act like happy to see it. Um, you know, you can use a high pitched voice like Fido, come. And you know, and you can clap your hands or you can whistle or you can say, come, 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 come. You know, and then when the dog gets to you, you know, give it, you know, give it some, give it some affection, give it some, uh, give it, give it praise, give it a food reward. So that way you're motivating your dog to come to you. You know, if you just say to the dog, hey, Fido, come, and then you don't really do anything, what do you expect? You got to motivate the dog to come to you. By the way, lemon meringue pie motivates me, but that's not a hint, okay? Um, okay, so movement. Don't go to your dog unless you want to correct it or prevent it from harm. What would be a correction? Just one of these people, you folks who have dogs that counter surf, without talking or making eye contact, you go over, grab your dog by the collar, not so, so hard that you would hurt it, and you just pull it down and walk it into another room. That's what I mean by redirect. Or when you're walking with your dog and it starts fussing about something, like say another dog, you would believe it or not, thank it to let you to let it know that you you're aware of its uh, discomfort or its alert, and then you just take it in another direction. That's another example of, of of redirecting. Okay, so so no movement toward the dog. So unless unless you want to correct it, so no. So if you want something from the dog, call it to you. Don't go to the dog. All right, next one, eye contact and talking. Eye contact works a lot differently in the canine world than it does in ours. Eye contact means action in the canine world. Uh, it, 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 it wants to know what do you want? And if you don't tell your dog what you want, it confuses it and puts pressure on it. So don't make eye contact with your dog unless you want something from it. But let's say if you want it to come to you and you're within line of sight, yes, make eye contact, which is like saying heads up, and then use, then use its name and use the come command. And again, motivate the dog to come to you. Well, guess what? Talking works just like 
eye, on, eye, eye contact. Don't talk to your dog unless you want something from it. And oh, by the way, let's say you call your dog to you, but it doesn't comply. Well, that doesn't put pressure on it because it knew what you want. It just chose not to comply. All right, so no eye contact and talking unless you, you want something from your dog. And when, you, when your dog comes to you, you can have a little conversation with it. And if you start seeing it get fussy, you know you're talking with it too much. It's starting to show pressure. And by the way, if you say no to a dog to correct it, you're sending it a mixed message because no means don't do this, but the acknowledge mean, acknowledgement means he has to do this. So what's the dog supposed to think? That really confuses them and puts, puts pressure on them, okay? Um, <clears throat> so that's affection and, and uh, 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 I'm sorry, that's eye contact and talking. Affection and attention. How the heck does a dog figure out where it fits in the pack and who's in charge? This is the primary way by seeking attention. So when your dog, sits in front of you and stares at you or comes over and paws you on the leg or puts its chin on your knee or whines at you, it's asking a question. Who is in charge now, you or me? And if you give it attention immediately, you're telling your dog it's in charge. And again, attention always means eye contact, talking or petting. So no eye contact, no talking, no petting. You want your dog to walk at least four steps away so we know it's done get, seeking attention. Then you can call it right back and give it all the love you want. So when you first disregarded your dog, you, you, you showed it that you're in charge because disregarding it says, I'm in charge, not you. And then when it subordinated itself to come to you, that's another leadership signal. Okay, uh, questions about this one, because this is the one that, that, that kind of gets people, gets them feeling guilty. Oh my God, you're supposed to ignore the dog? Yes, because you, you're relieving it of the leadership job is, is one of the best things you can do for it, particularly in terms of its emotional health. So questions. Did I make everybody speechless? Anyway, all right, so let's go with, go with uh, uh, separation, which you see, you're gonna see how these fit together. In the canine world, when a leader leaves the pack, it just goes. It doesn't interact with other pack members. It doesn't say I'm going down the creek to get a drink, okay? When it returns, it goes through a reuniting ritual. All canines go through this reuniting ritual. In fact, all canines do what we're talking about. And that reuniting ritual is that when a leader returns, it doesn't interact with other pack members until it has reinforced its leadership. In other words, it ignores them, all right? So how are we gonna mimic these signals in our world? Well, first of all, uh, what constitutes separation is closing a door. You close the door, even if it's your bathroom door. Dog is on one side, you're on the other. You have separated. It doesn't matter that the dog knows you're in there. According to the dog, you have separated. So, so when you come out, oh, and by the way, the other, other separation is when you go to sleep. So when you rejoin your dog from a separation, you want to disregard it at first. And we've kind of got two variations of reuniting, a, a short version and a longer version. So you're gonna start with the longer version, which is you want your dog to lie down and relax for five minutes. Why the five minutes? Because we wanna make sure the dog is done trying to get your attention and we wanna teach it self-control. We want to see, we, we wanna get self-control as opposed to us having to control the dog to keep it from jumping on you or jumping on company, for example, okay? So again, no interaction. You want the dog to go lie down, relax for five minutes. And once it's done that, you can call it to you and give it all the love you want. Then when you're hanging out together, you know, because you don't have, because you haven't separated, 
You can call your dog to you 20 times an hour, 30 times an hour if you want. Okay? Because you can get all you can give it all the affection you want until you separate again. The short verse, let's see. No, okay, so what happens if you put this in place? You're gonna see that your dog is gonna spend less and less time trying to get your attention when you return. And as it does that, you can shrink the relaxation time. And you're going to get to a point where the dog is going to hardly spend any time at all, maybe a matter of seconds of trying to get your attention when you return. All you want it to do then is just walk away a bunch of steps and you can call it right back. So it looks a lot like what you do when a dog seeks aff affection when you're hanging around. OK. Um, so that's that's the uh, separation and um, reuniting. Very important to do these. All right. Maintain personal space is simple. Dog only gets into your space by invitation. If it invades your space, you are going to gently push it away without making eye contact or talking. Um, and you want it to walk away before you call it back and give it love and, and, and or you know interact with it. OK. Um, and by the way, maintaining uh, personal, invading pers personal space is leaning against you, lying on your feet, um, any, any way the dog touches you. All right. <clears throat> Next up is who is on the throne? What the heck is this about? Well, your bed is your throne. Okay, it's, a spe it's special furniture because it's your throne. So what you, first, first of all, uh, so basically the dog shouldn't be up in the bed with you unless you have invited it into your bed, okay? If the dog is already in the bed when you, get on, when you wanna get on the bed, call the dog off the bed or you take it by the collar and pull it off the bed or if it's a small dog and you don't want it to hurt, get hurt because it, it, it wouldn't be good for it to have to uh, jump onto the floor or something, just pick it up and put it down without making eye contact or talking. Then if you want to have it up there for a cuddle, um, you can invite it up. And by the way, if a dog, even from across a room, is staring at you, who's trying to start the conversation? Your dog is. So you, you don't want to respond to that. Keep in mind, dogs can be tricky um, because they're testing you. They're trying to find out who's in charge, you or me. Yeah. Okay, so the so your bed is very special uh, furniture. If a dog wants to come up on a couch with you um, and the couch is big enough so it can get up there without having to touch you, then that's fine. That's not a problem unless the dog starts guarding the couch. You know, like it has a special spot on the couch and if you get too near it, it's going to start growling at you. If the dog, but if the dog comes up on the couch and you know lies right on, practically you know lies right next to you or gets in your lap without being invited, that's not that's not kosher. If you want the dog in your lap, then then you have to invite it in your lap. And by the way, in terms of the bed, some of you are probably wondering, you know, is it okay for the dog to sleep with me? I don't encourage that. If your dog's not aggressive and you haven't been in, and you invite the dog up into the bed, then you can get away with that. Okay. But if the dog is aggressive, I think you need to keep it off your bed, showing, you know, has aggressive behavior. Feeding. Um, leaders basically uh, control food. They are the providers. And dogs and, and wolves share lots in common. And I already mentioned it earlier before we started, is that both are predators, hunters. Um, uh, both are opportunistic eaters. They'll grab food when it's available. And both are scavengers. So one of the, what I want you to think about is that we are the only creatures on earth that know when we're going to eat again. And if we didn't know that, and you went over to a neighbor's house and you were really hungry or maybe not so hungry, and you didn't know when your next meal was gonna happen, you might steal something off your neighbor's counter too. 
So that's why the dog grabs stuff. I mean, you know, typically wolves hunt big game. Um, but if, if, if less food is available, a wolf has, you know, can catch a rabbit or something like that, it's going to eat the rabbit. All right. Anyway, in the canine world, food is food. It doesn't matter whether you put it in a bowl. It's in the form of a knuckle bone or a marrow bone or something you take out of your pocket. We make those distinctions, but they don't make those distinctions, okay? Uh, in the wild, so, so you're probably asking, thinking to yourselves already, well, how can we deter, how, how do we show that we're in charge of food? Uh, in the wild, particularly if food is on the scarce side, and by the way, keep in mind, I haven't said this yet, so anyway, I don't know about keeping in mind, but <laughs> anyway, um, in the wild, if wolves are really lucky, they might eat, you know, every three or four days because lots of hunts are unsuccessful. On average, they probably eat only six, every six or seven days. They can go as much as two weeks without food. So, you know, we worry about feeding the dog at, at you know, seven o'clock in the morning, five o'clock at night, and oh my God, we can't disrupt their uh, routine. Well, it's a good thing to disrupt their routine because they, if they know when the food is coming, then they think they're in charge of food. So you want to vary your routine, your feeding routine periodically, especially if your dog starts looking for food at a particular time uh, every day. Okay, so let me come back to uh, what I was going to say. How do we show that we're in charge of food? Um, we're going to do something called gesture eating. In the wild, when food is scarce, the leaders will eat first. Actually, they'll eat in pecking order. So leader number one will eat first. It eats undisturbed. You better not mess with the leader while it's eating, okay? It eats the best parts of the kill. Got to maintain strength because it's the leader. It eats all it wants to eat, which could be 15 to 20 pounds of meat because it doesn't know when it's going to eat again. When it leaves the kill, and by the way, no wolf would leave a kill until it has eaten as much as it wants because if you don't get all you want, you, know, you may not get back to that kill later on. So you better eat now, all right? So when it leaves the kill, that's the signal to the next in line. Uh, hey, it's your turn. <clears throat> and the same thing happens, occurs. The, the leader number two eats all it wants to eat. It eats undisturbed. It eats the best parts of the kill. And when it leaves the kill, number three in a pecking order, it's their turn. Excuse me. Okay, same thing happens. And so they go through the whole pack in pecking order. Um, <coughs> uh, and they, either, they, either they're, they keep doing this until they've all eaten or they run out of food. Okay, so how the heck are we going to replicate or mimic what happens in the wild? We're going to eat a little bit of human food before we put the dog's bowl down and step away. So you're going so so that so what does the dog see if you've done that? Maybe you've maybe you've had uh, two little pieces of cracker, a couple of pieces of cheese, a couple of grapes, whatever it is. If you eat something and put the bowl down and step away, and oh by the way, you haven't interacted with your dog. What does the dog see? The dog sees that you ate first, you ate the best parts of the kill, you ate all you wanted to eat. And then when you when you put that bowl down and stepped away, that's the signal to your dog that it's its turn. So that shows the dog how we're in charge of food. When so that's that's something you want to do for a couple of weeks. You know, if we have time, I can go into more detail. There there are there are videos online. There's a Tony Knight video online that shows you how to do gesture eating, um, and it's on YouTube. And so all you have to do is search in YouTube for gesture eating. Okay. And you'll see how you see how it's done in detail. But the idea is that you eat something before you put the bowl down and step away. Um, and by the way, when you eat something, you cannot fake the dog out. You can't go, oh, yummy, yummy, yummy. This is delicious roast beef from Stop and Shop. Because the dog sees that you haven't eaten. It hears that you haven't eaten. 
And most of all, with its powerful sense of smell, it smells, it doesn't smell a, a change in chemistry in your saliva. And by the way, for those of you who your dogs are nearby right now, uh, they can hear your heart's beating and they can smell your body chemistry. So if you got upset and your heart rate goes up and you and you're dumping adrenaline into your bloodstream, your dog would know it. Okay? That's how that's how sensitive their uh, how good their senses are. Um, Let's see if I'm missing anything. Oh, God, this is really important. When the dog leaves the bowl, regardless of whether it has finished its meal or not, you're going to pick the meal up. You're going to pick the bowl up. Meal time is over. And if you want to save it for the next feeding, you know, stick it in the refrigerator. Or if you're giving it breakfast and it doesn't eat its breakfast and you're around at lunchtime, you're going to try again. But generally, uh, what you're going to do is wait until the next feeding time. You can give the dog extra food. Now, this is probably getting some of you to think real guilty. You mean don't feed, don't feed the dog if it vacates the bowl? Well, I'll tell you something. It doesn't do that very many times before it learns um, that uh, you know it needs to eat, eat its entire meal. And by the way, dogs are picky eaters or don't eat uh, all their food because they're trying to show they control food. That's why they do this. Once you're the leader, I can, your dog is going to eat everything. All right. My dog doesn't mess. Well, she does mess around with food. The, you know, I pick the bowl up. Meal time is over. So you just eat for a couple of weeks and then you back off uh, to one or two days a week. If you need to tighten up, you go back to daily gesture eating. Um, other thing is uh, don't leave the empty bowl down, not even the empty bowl, because that's part of the kill. The dog will go over and lick it while you're watching you, and that, that dog is just reading uh, to you. Don't leave marrow or knuckle bones down, because if a dog can access food whenever it wants, that also tells it it's in charge of food. Okay, any questions so far? All right, let's move on to danger then. Okay, danger. Danger takes precedence. So you don't have to reunite with your dog to handle danger. In fact, you could be in the bathroom and if your dog starts barking, you could do part, you could do, you know, step number one, or actually do part of step number one. Okay, so how, how, are, how is danger handled in the wild? Um, it, it, it's, it's the Subordinate pack members, their job is to alert the leaders make decisions. So if a subordinate pack member howls or barks, um, the lead, one of the leaders, the, the number one is available, number one will come over and check it out. Number one has got three choices. Actually, uh, the choices are like ours, flight, freeze, or fight. Uh, I can't see all of you, but how many of you think, what, how many of you, uh, think that flight is the favorite choice of the leader in the wild when there is a danger? Raise your hands. Flight, F-L-I-G-H-T. I don't see any hand raising. Okay, so the other two choices are freeze and fight. How many think that freeze is the favorite choice of the leader? Okay, we got a few hands. How about fight? Okay, we got some fighters. Guess what? The favorite choice of the big, so-called big bad wolf is let's get the heck out of here. Flight. Because nobody gets hurt. And then the, the, the leader would lead the um, pack away. All right, so how, knowing this, how the heck are we going to handle danger? We want to be the ones that make the decisions about dangers. When the dog is the leader, it's making the decisions about dangers, and that's the rub. Because lots of things that aren't dangers, our dogs think they are, because they're in a world they don't understand, and that's what puts the pressure on them. By the way, they're on the job every waking moment when they are the leaders, okay? Um, so we want to take that job back from them. We want to be the decision makers when it comes to handling dangers, okay? 
So it's a three-step process. Your dog starts, let's start with you, with you and the dog inside. And, and I'm, and I'm going to go over this real quick. Step number one is you want to show the dog that you heard its alert and you appreciate it. So if it starts barking at something out there, not directly at you trying to get your attention, because that's a different story. If it's barking at something out there and it doesn't matter what the heck it is, you are going to say your dog's name and, th and thank you. So I would say, actually, I would say if my dog was named Fido, I would say, thank you, Fido. You're going to stay calm, which tells the dog this is not a problem. And then you're going to call your dog to you. And, and calmness is very important. If you get upset, and start fussing because the dog is barking. You're like, shut up, enough, quiet. Then you're telling the dog that this is really bad. This must be a bad one because you're barking too. So no wonder your dog's gonna be upset and start barking like crazy. All right, so step number one is, is thank the dog and call it to you. Now let's say if that, let's say that works, you're done. You don't have to do anything else. But by being calm, you've sent a message that this is not a problem. Nothing to get fussy about, nothing to get upset about. Now, if it doesn't work, the dog, you know, doesn't come to you or runs back and starts barking again, you do step number two, which is you're going to go take a look. And it doesn't matter whether or not you see anything, you're going to turn to your dog and thank it again. You know, Fido, thank you. And you're going to invite it to come with you. And if that works, you're done. Okay, um, if that doesn't work, you're gonna go to step number three because you've got to demonstrate to the dog in, in, a, in a way it understands that you handle dangers, not it. So you're gonna put your dog, you're gonna put your dog into timeout. And timeout is basically waltzing it to the nearest room, which could be a bathroom, and closing the door. And by the way, on the way, you're not going to talk to your dog or make eye contact. Remember, no interaction prior to uh, to uh, separating. If it if it's quiet, you you wait and see if it'll be quiet for a ten count, like about ten seconds. Uh, and if it is, you're going to let it out. And if it repeats the behavior, you're going to put it right back into timeout. Timeouts are very effective for addressing persistent behavior, like lots of barking or lots of jumping, or even pestering you for attention. Pestering you for attention, a good good start at that is just to ignore the dog, okay? Unless it's invading your space, then you gotta push it out of your space. Um, now let's say that you're inside and your dog is outside. You got a fenced in yard, it starts barking out there so you can stick your head out the door because you don't have to reunite. And again, you can thank your dog and call it to you. And then the other, you know, the other, the other variation that kind of works the same is going to take a look and have, inviting the dog to come with you. Uh, if your dog is outside and you can't get it to stop barking, it, it makes no sense to bring it in and give it a timeout. If you can bring it in, fine, and then just ignore it because it's too protracted to give it a timeout. Okay. If you are on the hunt, walk to us, hunt to the dog, then um, you're going to thank your dog and take it away from whatever it's fussing at, fussing about. Whether that, whether that's a, a dog, the dog perceives it as a danger, or perceives it as prey. All right. So let's see now. What so we had loud noises. That, that's one of the questions. I mean, dogs don't understand our world, so you know anything like. Um, a motorcycle, the, the FedEx truck, because it sounds different. Um, thunder could be thunder that's a lot of noise that they're afraid of. Uh, so let's let's take let, let's exclude thunder and fireworks, something like that, uh, or an appliance like a vacuum cleaner. But you know, the, your general run-of-the-mill uh, loud noise out there is that what you're thinking of? Like a car, a motorcycle, the FedEx truck, something like that then you're gonna use the danger routine. You're gonna thank your dog and call it to you. Uh, you're gonna go take, if that doesn't work, you're gonna go take a look. And by the way, when you go take a look, if you can get in front of your dog, it's not a necessity, but decisions are made from the front of the pack. 
So that's why you want to get in front of your dog, okay, if you can. And then, of course, the third step again is timeout. Um, okay. So, real, any questions on this so far? Lead the hunt. That's that's the uh, uh, the last area that we're going to um, probably have time to cover. And again, you can always call me and ask me questions. And, and if you want to cure pulling on the leash, then you want to be the leader. You want the dog walking nicely by your side on a loose leash, right? I mean, you could get it there with obedience, but the dog doesn't really want to be there, but it's, but it's being obedient. It's complying. The way to have it want to be by your side is for you to be the leader. Then it will stay there because it feels safe with you. And that's why it wants to be there. So, the, so the, the, there's several actually steps to this, but um, you know, if you're, uh, there, there, are some, uh, there, there are some good videos um, online that will help show this to you. But the primary exercise, so let me, I'm just trying to figure out how to compact this. Basically, you want to get out the door first, which means the dog is either waiting for you to step out there or it's walking nicely by your side and you want to get back in first when you return to your house. Get out first because that's what the, because the decisions are made from the front of the pack. Get back in first because it should be your job as leader to check for dangers. Okay. A primary way uh, of uh, getting there is for you to do this exercise called stop, start, change direction. That's kind of our lingo. Uh, I don't like to use our lingo. You can call it follow the leader, but our lingo describes this well because deci decisions are leadership signals. And what does stop, start, change direction mean? If you stop, and your dog stops, who's made the decision? You have, right? If you change direction and your dog follows you, who's made the decision about where you're going? You have, right? So you can practice this little exercise in your home. If you look up stop, start, change direction in um, YouTube or SSCD, the initials, I like to call it follow the leader. Uh, you'll find a whole bunch of videos up on it. Make sure you're watching a video demonstrated by a dog listener. There is a video on the resources page on my website of me doing it with my Sally. Okay, so so stop, start, change direction is basically call the dog to your side. Uh, you can do it inside or outside. I'd recommend you start doing with 90% of it inside because there's fewer distractions. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna have your dog more paying more attention to you. And all you do is walk four steps forward, stop, turn, and retrace your steps. And you keep repeating that until the dog starts following you nicely, stopping when you stop and, and changing direction when you change direction. It might take you 15 to 20 minutes to get there, maybe longer because dogs don't have timetables, but you could do it five minutes at a time and still be, um, effective. The other way, another way to do stop, start, change direction is just to walk forward four or five steps with your dog by your side and then backpedal for four or five steps. So you're building in plenty of stops and changes of direction in a short amount of time. In five minutes, you can send your dog 50 leadership signals. Okay. Uh, play real quick is you want to choose the toy. You use it to start the play, start the game. You make up the rules and you end the game. So if, the, so if you want to play fetch, the dog has got to play by the rules. If it varies from the rules, it means it's trying to take over the game. And oh, by the way, if the dog brings you a toy, what's the question it's asking? Who's in charge now, you or me? You got to ignore that. If the dog brings you a dish towel. What is that? What's the question it's asking? Who's in charge, you or me? So, but this towel, this towel could be dangerous, right? So one of the ways to get it away is just to trade it with a, trade it for a food reward. If the dog figures out the game that by grabbing something, it can get a food reward, then you go to the second method, which is to kind of secretively drop a treat on the floor. 
If that if the dog figures out that game, you go to the third one, which is just go close yourself into another room. The dog loses you, that they don't like to lose you. So the likelihood is that it's going to drop whatever it has in its mouth and you can go pick it up. Okay. So um, that, you know, and by the way, toys are trophies in the canine world. So the more toys your, your dog has, the more it elevates its, its status in the pack. So if you've got a whole basket full of toys, take and you've got one dog, take three of them out, put the rest in the way. You can rotate toys. If you got a couple of you know nyla bones or something, that's okay also. And by the way, no food bones that a dog can can chew on forever and ever because that tells them they're in charge of food. Phil's website is a wealth of information because I'm like taking notes on this and like really um, looking forward to it. It's philthedoglistener.com. Yep, and, and I thank you, you so much for coming and Ann for, for you giving me this opportunity. It's the most enjoyable.